The tragedy of the First World War is etched into the collective memory of European people. It was a watershed in their self-confidence, questioning their common faith in progress, patriotism, in civilization itself, and even in the existence of a benign God. <laughs> Under the flags of past battles, the old familiar rituals of Christian sacrifice take place. Only a lifetime ago, three quarters of a million people died here for a couple of square miles of ground, when the heirs to the culture of Voltaire were bled white by the heirs of Goethe and Beethoven. A memory still terrible, but fading now as only the very old remain to remember the pointlessness of it all. Those of us born later can only imagine. We that are young, said Shakespeare, shall never see so much, nor live so long. after centuries of conflict, the Europeans are finally moving to unite. The descendants of the barbarians, of the Franks, Goths, Angles and Saxons, the first people in history to spread their civilization across the whole planet. The battlefield of Verdun is the most poignant reminder of how a supposedly rational and humane civilization can descend to terrifying violence and irrationality, all in the name of civilization. And that brings us to that most difficult of tasks, which is to see ourselves as others see us, to see our culture as we would a foreign country. And there, the inescapable lesson of history is that for all the great achievements of the West, for all its humanistic values and its egalitarian principles, its character is touched by a deep strain of violence. And that's the paradox which confronts us as we look to the future of civilization at a time when all across the world the values of the West are supposed to have triumphed. We Greeks live around the sea like frogs around a pond, said Socrates. This is Samos, and here began the quest which would lead Western man to the exploration of space and the conquest of nature itself. Here for the first time, Western man speculated on the composition of the universe observing the geometries of nature.
questioning the role of humanity in this order, the existence of God. On Samos and its neighboring coasts were born the scientists who laid the foundations of our modern view of the universe. The most famous was Pythagoras, author of the theorem we all learn at school, and in a mountain cave here, a tradition of him has still survived. It might sound like a simple folk tale, but the tradition was first recorded not long after Pythagoras's day, and it contains an important kernel of truth that for all their brilliant qualities of mind, the Greeks had to borrow from Africa and Asia to create their civilization. In the West, we look upon this moment as the birth of science and reason, but it would be more accurate to describe it as the birth of Western science and reason, because right across the old world at this time, around 500 BC, it was an astonishingly creative epoch, the Axis Age, the time of Confucius and Lao Tzu in China, of the Buddha and the great grammarians and philosophers in India, of the Zoroastrians, the Jewish prophets, and the philosophers and poets here in Greece, all of them grappling in their own way with the ultimate question, the nature of reality itself. Still the ultimate question, whatever your line of business, whether it's poetry, religion, or particle physics. But this was the first time that the West, Europe, had participated in these great currents of civilization emanating from Asia. And here in Samos, it's easy to see why, because that's Asia over there. It's that close. In fact, the Greek word Asia originally meant simply that coastline in front of us. So that's the beginning of the great land mass, the teeming heartland of civilization, stretching away across the fertile crescent to Iraq, Iran, India and China. So not surprisingly, Pythagoras and his contemporaries had imbibed Asian ideas, Babylonian astronomy and mathematics, Indian ideas about the soul and about rebirth. They may have transformed them with their own genius, but the Greeks still shared the basic beliefs of those other civilizations, that the universe was an ordered, beautiful and harmonious whole. In their language, a cosmos. Man is by nature a political animal, said the Greeks. The new scientific view of the world was the catalyst for a new politics, democracy. And the first democracy was Athens. Buildings of classical Athens, like the Parthenon, are monuments to that new order. Like 18th century Britain or America, Greek democracy was limited. It excluded slaves and women. But it took the essential step of putting politics into the hands of the citizens. That was what the Greeks called politismos, civilization. For the Greeks, the essential quality of civilized life was humanism.
the idea that man is the measure of all things, that the fulfillment of each individual's potential was the goal of civilization. This idea permeated all the legacies in art, philosophy and literature which the Greeks bequeathed to our modern world. In the dramatic festivals, 30,000 citizens saw these great issues of fate and freedom acted out for all to see. The Greeks understood early on that civilization is fragile, that it is a hard thing to maintain an open society, that the irrational will always threaten to burst out in human life with terrifying force, no matter how noble society's ideals. said Aristotle are intelligent and free and have the capacity to rule all mankind. And in the 4th century BC, under Aristotle's pupil, Alexander the Great, they invaded the Near East. The valley of the Nile thronged with Greek colonists. In Upper Egypt, the monuments were covered with graffiti by awestruck Greek tourists. To think, fumed an Egyptian priest, we taught these upstarts all they know. And at Luxor, in the inner shrine of the ancient Egyptian temple, striding like a pharaoh of old, is the violent golden boy of Western history, Alexander himself. Overrunning Babylonia and Persia, the Greeks now crossed the Khyber Pass and poured into India, building their colonies on the northwest front. Alexander's successors went further still. In the second century BC, they sent devastating expeditions down the Ganges sacking the ancient religious center at Benares. And at the little village of Kasambi is graphic evidence of the trail of destruction. Here, a Buddhist monastery has been excavated, which was swept by a Greek firestorm, torched by Greek mercenaries sweltering out here, so far from home. Java, uh, Supari, and blacks. These were terrible times, said the Indians. The vicious but valiant Greeks ruined our land with fire and famine, killing women and children, and even our cows. Such was the first time the West went out to the world. But the Greek conquests liberated tremendous historical energies. Trade routes now opened through Central Asia on the Silk Route to China. In earlier times, said the historian Polybius, the world's history had been a series of unrelated episodes. But from now on, history becomes an organic whole. The affairs of Europe and Africa are connected with those of Asia, and all events bear a relationship and contribute to a single end.